or need permission to record and did not get it. If I don't see anything, we'll assume everybody's got what they need. Do what do I what do I need to do? You don't need to do anything, I don't okay. think. Okay. I'm gonna let Shannon get started with Facebook Live. Rachel, are we okay? I'm waiting for Shannon to get started with the Facebook Live. Okay. Looks like we're good to go. Okay. So let's get started. Welcome everyone again to our media members. If you were not here with us earlier in the week, you can record this. You have permission to do so. You also are able to take this live and share it to your social media platforms today. This is our daily briefing for Wednesday, April 1st. And we do have a lot of information for you today from Lucas County Sheriff John Tharp, Deputy Lucas County Administrator and Manager of the Emergency Operations Center, Matt Hireman. But we wanna begin with Toledo Lucas County Health Department Commissioner, Eric Jasinski, and the case numbers that we have from Lucas County today. Commissioner. Thank you, Chris, I, I appreciate that. Um, could we get the numbers up on the screen? Uh, Rachel, thank you. Um, today we have uh, 133 cases, um, and uh, again, this is uh, this is the hard part. Um, we've had two additional deaths, so a total of five. Um, again, our heartfelt sympathy out to those individuals who have lost a loved one. Um, again, just know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. Uh, also, then too, um, those those two individuals who did pass were males in their 50s. Uh, the breakdown of cases so far are 62 females, 71 males, um, ages uh, 19 to 98. Uh, do we have the map, Rachel, by any chance? Here, uh, we're, we're doing a better job of getting this updated for us. And uh, as you can see, here is the updated uh, zip code map with cases. Uh, we'll continue to update this as time goes along. Uh, before I get that back to Chris, um, again, I really need to thank my staff uh, at the health department. Uh, the, the community really needs to understand how much they're putting into their job. They're, they're working 12, 16 hour days, uh, taking calls late at night, um, and then having to actually deal with individuals um, who have lost loved ones and, and having to talk to them about that and try to get those contact tracings. And uh, again, um, Think about them as, as this goes along and, and just thank you very much to the health department staff for what they do. So Chris, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, appreciate it. And again, all of our condolences yes. to 
uh, the families and friends who have lost loved ones already and to those who have loved ones who are fighting the virus right now. Included in those positive case numbers are an inmate and a nurse, both from the Lucas County Jail. Sheriff John Tharp is here to talk more about that. Sheriff, I can't imagine what a challenge it must be in a shared shelter environment like you are running there at the jail to make sure that everybody is staying healthy. And we're gonna talk about what you're doing um, on that front in just a moment. But what can you tell us about the inmate who was tested positive and the nurse? Thank you. And thank you for organizing this. Um, I'm John Tharp, your sheriff of Lucas County. And uh, our condolences too goes out to everyone that is ill. And we certainly are concerned about the health and well-being of, of our entire county in the United States. <clears throat> we did have two people um, that have tested positive uh, for the virus. And one is a nurse. And the nurse was tested positive uh, on March 30th. Uh, she has been in the hospital. Uh, she has been treated. She's been released. And home, I talked to her uh, the other night. She seems to be doing a lot better. She feels very confident that she will rebound. And the other um, individual was an inmate that we had in our facility. And uh, on uh, March 29th, uh, he was tested at the hospital and he was positive that he had the virus. Uh, this M8 um, court case, uh, he is, or she has agreed to plead. Uh, she has been released. Uh, she's home. And um, so she'll be coming back for her sentencing at a later date. Uh, there are numerous things that our uh, staff has put together and I give them a lot of credit for the work that they've done. And, and uh, it's almost, it is 24 seven operation that we have. We have inmates uh, bunched in with each other. Uh, it's unbelievable. I give the judges uh, credit and that they have worked hard and looked and decided who really needs to be in our facility. And if I could go ahead and take time to talk about that a little bit, is that our facility, go ahead, you were going to interrupt me there. I, I was just, no, I was, I was just gonna say, I know you guys have been planning for this and you have put quite a few things in place, right? For you yes. to be able to prepare for uh, mitigating this. Yes, and uh, one of the things that we've done is work with the judges. Uh, the judges have uh, looked at who really needs to be in the facility at this time. As we look at our facility, it's a pretrial facility, and there's only two reasons that people really need to be in there. Is they're a threat to society um, and or if they're a flight risk. And so the judges have evaluated and looked who needs to be in there. So we have reduced the population quite a bit in the, the correction facility. And we have put numerous things in place and we've been planning for this for several weeks. As soon as we heard about this, as we started planning and some of the things that we've done and we will continue to do is looking at all the people that come into our facility is uh, uh, visitors, our employees to start with at the front door when they come in, we take their temperatures. Uh, we I take the temperature of the visitors. We give all the visitors a mask uh, when they come in. And we ask them to wear the mask while they're in our facility. Is that um, we have um, decided with all the inmates that are booked, the people that are booked in our, to our facility, we immediately uh, take their temperature and uh, we separate them and uh, leave them in the booking area for 24 hours. And, and from there, we continue to take their temperature three times a day. We place them into the, uh, uh, separate them for 72 hours. And again, we check their temperature for uh, three times a day to make sure that they're not ill. Once we are confident that they're okay to go into general population, then we put them into the general population and continue to take their temperature and check on them. Um, but then every 24 hours, that area that they are in is cleaned and sanitized. And we do that aggressively. 
we, um, we've eliminated uh, most of the contacts or uh, physical visitations uh, with the inmates other than attorneys. And attorneys, uh, many of them have chosen not to come in and visit. We have uh, Skype and visitation uh, by phone with uh, the attorneys with also families that want to visit their loved ones that are locked up in the facility. They can do it by phone. Uh, they can do it with iPads, et cetera. So this is uh, bound to, to be positive. Uh, we, um, we put together a plan for our officers, God forbid, if they start getting sick. Excuse me. So the plan that we put together is that if we need staff, if we need people to fill in for officers, if they do happen to get sick, is that one of the things that we can do is we can recall officers that are, are not ill, that are willing to come in and work additional sick shifts. Um, we have uh, officers on task forces that we could pull in. Um, we can stop there uh, working with those task forces, whether it be um, with the um, Metro Drug Unit or uh, DART Unit or other units or et cetera that they're working, we can pull on them to bring them in to help with overseeing uh, inmates. We, um, we've arranged to call retired special deputies uh, that are qualified and are correction trained. We can call them and we've contacted them and been in conversation with them that they're on standby to be able to be uh, called in to help us reserve deputies. We have a reserve unit that we can pull and we have uh, quite a few officers that have said that they would come in and help uh, just to give them a call. Furthermore, we could, we're looking at possibly 12 hour shifts. Uh, fellow, fellow sheriffs um, have talked to uh, us and told us that they would be willing to help so we could reach out to other sheriff's offices and to assist uh, us as the same as we would assist them. And uh, we, um, we can contact the, um, the state uh, through the emergency management and state corrections and ask for assistance through the state corrections. So we do have a plan in place as to uh, if our officers uh, get sick, we need additional manpower to, to and, run the operation. And just to be clear on that though, you have been relatively lucky. Your, your force is pretty intact right now, right? It is, it is. And uh, so um, we uh, have not sure, tested. Can we, go back, can we go back for just a minute to um, officers or other inmates who might have been in contact with the individuals who tested positive for COVID-19? And have you done that tracing and made sure yes. nobody else is sick there? Yes, we've, we've traced um, back to uh, people that had contact no one that's showing any symptoms. We haven't tested anyone uh, that is related to this, these um, two situations that we have. We have not uh, identified anybody that has been ill or sick or showing any of the symptoms. So we have not tested anyone uh, related to this particular incident. And I think you had a couple of uh, inmates that might have been in contact, but they were placed in a quarantine situation for a bit in accordance with your plan, correct? Yes. So we had two inmates um, that uh, was in contact and with, the, uh, with the one that was uh, diagnosed and tested. They were placed into quarantine. We also had another nurse that had contact and she self-quarantined and uh, so she's doing well. Good, okay. So you have put a lot of things in place, Sheriff. Thank you. I know there will be questions for you coming up here, but the planning done at the Lucas County Sheriff's Department and many other organizations has in many cases been coordinated through the Emergency Operations Center, which is a joint effort between the city, the county and the health department. And EOC manager, Matt Hireman is also with us to talk about how the EOC operates and Matt, you've been working on these plans for uh, some time, trying to get everything prepared and uh, look ahead to all contingencies uh, in the county. 
Tell us what the EOC's role is in a situation like COVID-19. Sure, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, so yeah, uh, pandemic uh, planning has been going on for going on 15 to 20 years in our community. We've had extensive planners working on this for a long time. Um, but really the Emergency Operations Center is what's called a multi-agency coordinating center. Uh, it's an organization that allows all of our communities and agencies uh, in the county to collaborate in response to this or any type of incident. Uh, the way that the structure works is at the top of the organization, obviously we have our community's top elected leaders. Um, they set policy and make high level decisions that drive our organization, uh, drop our, drive our decision making. Um, below them, uh, we have an EOC manager that's, I'm serving that role currently. Um, I report directly to them and work with our team here in the uh, Lucas County Emergency Operations Center. Um, and then right next to me on my hip every single day, uh, I have a deputy manager that's uh, Chief John Kaminsky from the Toledo Fire Department. Uh, he assists day in and day out in our EOC management. And he steps in when I'm not available. And in the event that I would become sick or ill, he can just step right into that role and uh, provide that resource. So we, we have... Uh, we have continuity of operation with all the people in our organization so that should we lose someone due to illness, we're able to adapt. Um, underneath uh, that EOC management team, we have four sections that are led by section chiefs. Um, we have a finance section, a logistics section, an operations section, and a planning section. The finance section obviously supports payment of all of our bills and tracking of our costs associated with the disaster. Uh, we also work with communities uh, throughout the county and agencies to make sure they're tracking the impact um, so that they would be eligible for funding should it come through from the federal or state level. Um, we also have a logistics section um, that keeps our resources moving. So they operate a warehouse. Uh, I think this has been covered a little bit in the media where donations and personal protective equipment and other things come in and are distributed to our first responders and our hospitals and our nonprofits. Uh, the logistics section also uh, identifies, uh, acquires and uh, provides resource needs throughout our system of operation. So we have examples like water buffaloes that provide water when there's water outages. Uh, we have cones, anything really, um, goes through that logistics branch to make sure that it is properly sent to the right locations. The next branch we have is uh, our operations branch, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it coordinates the operational components of our response. Uh, police, fire, EMS, health department, mass care, which is the provision of housing and sheltering services to people, uh, as well as food. Um, each one of these functions has a lead and a team that coordinates with every single police fire, EMS, and nonprofit organization in our county. So that all flows the daily operations of the county uh, together. Um, and finally, our last branch is the planning branch. They do both short-term and long-term planning. Uh, short-term is assisting us to identify our objectives each day. They set up a, a set of objectives. We bring them through the team. We have discussions at the executive level about those objectives and set them for the next planning period. Our entire organization is an objective driven organization. So we identify in the next operational period, we run 24 hour operational periods. These are our top objectives. Assignments come out of those objectives and are distributed out throughout our organization. And then they're delivered. And then the next day we do the same, but our planning branch has to be a day ahead of us. They always have to be thinking what is coming tomorrow and they need to be setting those objectives ahead of time. The planning branch also works on long-term. It's a tough job because they're also looking at those longer term planning things like how are we gonna provide sheltering uh, if people lose housing or if people like our first responders need sheltering opportunities if they've been quarantined or isolated. Um, so they're working on those longer term planning initiatives which are pretty complex. Um, so it's, it's a tough job to be in the planning uh, section of our operation. Traditionally, um, our EOC is activated and we bring all of our people down to our bunker here, uh, in the first floor of the emergency services building. but uh, obviously, this is a different type of incident, which has obviously created all different types of challenges for us. Um, and so we, while we have a very small group, group of people that operate off our emergency operations center, really five or six people in a facility that's designed to house 40 to 50. Again, so we can still have that proper social distancing that I know our health commissioner is always talking about and Dr. Acton's talking about. The rest of our teams are operating virtually and digitally. Um, and we've one of the most amazing things to me has been our ability to overcome that constraint. Um, so we have multiple digital platforms we're working on. We have an amazing program called Basecamp um, where we're able to share messaging, um, documents, identify objectives, action items, and resources, and share those things in real time with each other no matter where we are in the world. Um, so, and then obviously we make 
use of what every other uh, organization in this country is making use of, which is tele and video conferencing applications, just like the one we're using here today. So all those things are critical things that we've put in place for us to operate together. I've been thinking as a new member of the team, how uh, lucky we are to have that technology to be able to keep everybody together and apart, right? Because it, you really can't be in close quarters like that as much as you need to. We are able to be in close touch this way, um, Matt, across the entire team. And the other thing I just want everybody to know as a new person involved here, I have been blown away and just feel totally confident about the hands that we are in. Um, this team is really uh, amazing in, in the scope of what they're um, planning and the things that they're looking out for. And the folks in the county, I think, should know that they're in really good hands. Matt, you are planning for so many different things right now. Can you just talk about a few of the things you guys have to plan for on a daily basis? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, every day when we come in, we have an emergency operations center briefing. We do it uh, virtually with the 40 or 50 members that we have spread out across our community um, virtually. Um, and on that, again, we give a situational update to everybody. Um, we identify the top resource needs, the top information needs, and then obviously our top objectives, again, because we're an objective-driven organization. Um, so today, our top objectives that we're working on in this planning period, and some of these objectives cross over multiple planning periods, um, but uh, one of the top objectives we're working on today is the establishment of a non-congregate uh, shelter for our exposed first responders and healthcare workers. So a real challenge we have is that we have people that we've asked to put themselves and their families at risk by going out every day and having direct contact uh, with people in our community in high risk interactions. Um, it's not easy for firefighters to provide the services in an environment where being in close contact can be uh, a risk. So we are working on a what we call a non congregate sheltering plan so that for those first responders who do get exposed and are asked to be in isolation or quarantine, many of them out of respect for their families, or if they have individuals in their home who are immunocompromised, we need to provide them another living arrangement to support them as they make their way through that 14 day process. Um, so we're uh, working on a plan uh, actually in partnership with our hospital systems, uh, the Board of Developmental Disabilities and the Homelessness Board to try and create uh, you know, a solution for those people that cannot go to another place. Um, the other, uh, the second objective we're really working on today is planning for the impacts that this is going to have on um, delivery of food resources. So many of the volunteers and people that keep mobile meals and things like that rolling, um, they may themselves either um, be sick or be in those categories of people that shouldn't really be having that kind of contact. So um, we appreciate the United Way has been helping us to coordinate this and they've given us a resource as a member of our emergency operations center team that's operating virtually um, from home, uh, who really understands those programs, understands where the shortfalls are and can and will continue to come. Um, so we are really working on that pretty strongly today. And then the last one is the biggest one, um, which is how we can integrate into the governor's statewide plan for uh, regionalization of our healthcare services in preparation for the surge that you know Dr. Acton's been telling us about now for uh, two or three weeks. Right. So Matt, on that subject, when can we expect that to happen? We know that we we saw today on his map in his news conference that we are in uh, region one here in Northwest Ohio. Um, but when do you expect that to happen? And how does the EOC integrate into that kind of state and National Guard-led regional approach? Sure. So um, as I think the governor has laid out, uh, he has divided the state into eight regions. Um, and obviously, Lucas County is one of 18 counties in the Northwest region, which is labeled Region 1. Um, basically, the lead on this uh, is the Regional Hospital Multi-Agency Coordinating Committee. Um, so this has been established. It's, it's no small task. Uh, it's been uh, stood up very quickly. Um, they basically brought together all 32 hospitals in our 18 county region. Uh, and that committee basically serves as a communication and resource um, organization. They are essentially a emergency operation center for hospitals. Um, and so they have brought all of those people together. Um, the emergency operation center, the public health departments in that region, as well as the Ohio National Guard, the best way to think of them is we are like three legs of a stool. We're working to support the most important piece in this entire response, which is the hospital, which is the seat of our stool, if you think about it. 
Um, so that health, that hospital multi-agency coordinating center uh, needs to be prepared. So we are doing everything we can with them to support them um, to respond to the surge that we know that is coming. And each of us, each of the legs of that stool, we know we have a role. The health department is uh, involved with disease response and prevention. They have epidemiologists who are tracing and utilizing the tracing tools that they have to try and reduce the spread. That is their primary uh, piece of this puzzle. Um, the EOC is trying to work with all these organizations to keep everyday operations going, to keep as much of a normal environment as we can. And we provide any types of resources outside of a medical environment uh, that those hospitals need. And that non-congregate sheltering uh, agreement, that's one of those resources, right? One of the challenges that healthcare organizations have in a time like this is keeping healthcare workers healthy and able to come back to work. Um, and so one of the ways we can support that is by having a uh, sheltering, a non-congregate sheltering option for their employees so that those healthcare organizations can work on doing the things that they're good at, which is helping to keep our friends and family safe. And we can focus on supporting some of their needs with their healthcare workers. And then obviously the third leg of that stool, which is a critical piece and incredibly supportive uh, is the National Guard. Um, they're building and planning and uh, will, will someday if necessary, operate an alternative care facility. Um, that some people will call field hospitals. Again, they are our insurance plan, if you think about that. We're hoping that it does, the surge doesn't get to that point where we need that. Our hospitals are doing the best they can within their bricks and mortar to try and make this work, and they will have their own alternate care facilities to support themselves. But should all of those things be tasked, taxed, I'm sorry, the National Guard is preparing and identifying places all throughout our state in which they can support that surge beyond the walls uh, of hospitals that we actually know. Well, it is an amazing operation and to pull not only the government agencies, but all of those community agencies, right? Um, manufacturing and businesses and the hospitals, the healthcare networks, all kind of into one umbrella where everyone is uh, has a seat at the table and you all have been getting input and managing all of those things in a huge, huge way. What would you like everyone to know about uh, the Lucas County uh, team and the work that you're doing? Sure, so I guess the one thing I would say, which has been incredible through this entire response, um, is we really are one county, we are one region, and we are one community. We really are gonna rise and fall together. So the things that we do every day with social distancing and washing hands of our individual uh, residents, all the way up to the hospitals that need to deliver that service when people get sick, we all have to work together we will rise and fall together. So we all have to do our part and we appreciate everyone's collaboration as we've gone through this. It really has been incredible in very tough times. As Eric said, I appreciate every single person that's working as a part of our organization and all the organizations that we're touching. People are putting in incredible hours. I've never seen people work as many hours consistently for a number of time as I have seen in this incident. No, the whole team is just fantastic. Again, I just feel so confident about um, the hands that we're in here. I want to open it up to questions and uh, maybe we can start, Eric, with you because sure. you know, we have a few questions on uh, coming in through the Facebook feed and people are asking why our number in Lucas County, which is at 133 today, I believe you said, is um, different from the state number that's being reported of 171. If you can just kind of briefly explain how that works. Sure, uh, again, um, we're giving you the best numbers that we have at this point in time, uh, the 131 uh, relative to the states. Again, there's, uh, I think Gretchen said it very well the other day that there's lag time. Um, that's the number that we have at this point in time as, the, as they roll in. Um, we continue just to, to get those numbers in, process those individuals that we have positive on, for those contact tracings and every day we come in with with the number that we have at that point in time okay um from diane larson at uh, 13 abc uh, one question here is about the enforcement of non-essential businesses or businesses who are not operating yes. um, correctly and um, people who um, say they are um, you know, seeing those types of things. And today the governor said that uh, anybody who has a complaint should be contacting the local health department, which we talked about yesterday, yes. will yes. aggressively enforce the state order. So 
Um, how many businesses have you investigated? Do you know? And what are you all doing to enforce those rules? Um, relative to the enforcement, uh, we are we are calling them as we've we've stated before to find out what they're doing. Uh, again, a lot of this is education. Um, some are those recalcitrant in individuals that we'll, we'll, we'll take care of through that enforcement process. But again, we want to make sure that everybody's doing what they need to do to protect the community. And nobody, I don't think, wants to do anything wrong. So again, we're out there making that education piece. However, if they refuse to follow what we want uh, relative to the social distancing and or non-essential business, uh, we, we will go ahead and send law enforcement out to those facilities to go ahead then and Make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, if they don't, then we will go ahead and uh, take further action against them, which is, uh, again, um, through the legal system, but shutting that place down if we have. Okay, Matt, um, can you tell us how many first responders, this comes from Andrew Asmus at WTOL, um, how many first responders are currently in quarantine in the county? Um, up in Detroit, apparently the police department is really struggling with cases of COVID there. Are there concerns anywhere in the county about stations or departments having enough bodies to respond to emergencies? Sure, so uh, as of right now, our current reporting shows that we have 43 uh, public safety officials in quarantine or isolation. Um, we've established uh, a very uh, comprehensive policy in partnership with our police and fire chiefs um, so that we are, whenever any uh, fire a uh, firefighter or police officer um, comes into a high risk contact um, in which PPE was not there uh, with somebody that is suspected or tested positive of COVID-19. Um, they are submitting an exposure form in real time to our health and wellness officers. We have a 24 hour health and wellness officer program operating. Um, that goes to a health and wellness officer, is reviewed, additional information is gathered and then it goes to a medical director. And in real time, 24 seven, we give an answer back so that we can put our officers' minds at ease as to whether they need to quarantine or isolate. We give that back to them. Uh, and then we work through that process. Once the decision would be made to put them in quarantine, um, we uh, have a 14 day process in which they sit in that quarantine. So to make sure that we're protecting the rest of our workforce, we obviously don't want a, an exposed firefighter to come back to uh, their station if they've been exposed. And we obviously don't want them working on people in the public and potentially spreading uh, COVID-19 beyond there. So even while that officer is on quarantine, we are doing everything we can to do tracing of the individual that was the source of that, uh, that contamination. And so when we do that, then that's many of those, those tests will come back negative and that allows us to put that officer dynamically back onto the line. So we have an elaborate process that helps us work through this so that we can uh, safely protect our officers and protect the public, but also we can keep a steady flow of officers um, on the streets every day. And I can tell you uh, from talking to our ESF-4, which is our firefighting desk, and our ESF-13 law enforcement desk, uh, we currently are still at an appropriate level of firefighters and law enforcement to provide the essential services that uh, we know we need. And again, maybe, you know, partially because um, people have not been calling as often, right, for um, emergency responders not using, we know those emergency calls have been down from people who are staying at home and trying to free them up for other things. Um, I want to go back to, and Gretchen uh, DeBacker, the um, public information liaison for the EOC, I want to bring her into this now because I know we didn't get a number from Eric on the um, businesses uh, that the health department is now um, investigating, but you have that number, Gretchen? Yes, we have approximately 146 business complaints that have come in um, and continue to come in through the hotline. Please remember that the hotline was just established this week. That number is 419-213-4161. So we're in the process now of consolidating that, pro that, that mechanism so that people are not calling 911 or the non-emergency number or 211 or engage Toledo. 419-213-4161 is the number to call if you have questions about the way a business is operating or whether or not um, you are an essential employee or whether an essential employee is uh, behaving the way that they are supposed to pursuant to the governor's orders. I can also tell you, um, uh, you all, that there are 10 sanitarians that work for the Toledo Lucas County Health Department that are daily going through these uh, and responding back. When you ask about contact, 
What I can't confirm for you right now is what the level of contact is. Here's our flow chart. People call the number and leave a message. These individuals take those messages and they, the first step is to call those businesses and say, hey, we have this report that you're doing this thing that you're not supposed to be doing. Let's talk about it. What are you doing? What is your process? Uh, here's what you're supposed to be doing. Depending on the um, response from the business owner or the manager, that's when we determine the next step. If uh, the business owner or individual or manager is non-responsive or believes they don't have to respond, that's when we go to the next level and there's the opportunity um, for law enforcement in the region where that business is located to become involved. The health department is taking this very seriously uh, and are responding as quickly as possible to the complaints that are coming in um, to that line. Okay, on that same uh, note, Michaela Marshall um, from 13 ABC is asking specifically about Hobby Lobby, which came up today. And I just wanna kind of point out like, what is exactly an essential business has been a little bit um, unclear, right? So how, how do people know? Maybe they think they are an essential business and it, that doesn't fall under the criteria of the governor's plan. I don't know if Eric or Gretchen, either one might have comment on that. Well, again, yeah, I have no problem with taking this. Um, Hobby Lobby is an essential business. Um, I would suggest that it is not at this point in time. Um, however, some might consider that, you know, going out and getting a craft to be able to come home and actually work on it uh, would, would actually constitute the ability to, you know, go through a, 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 a quarantine or this process that, that we're actually uh, up against. Um, I would suggest that Hobby Lobby truly look at themselves and figure out if they need to be open at this point in time, um, if they are actually providing a service to the community, such as a grocery store or somebody who really needs to be out and about to produce something. I wanna caution us all though too, it's it just not Hobby Lobby, but there's other entities out there other facilities that we should be looking at as well, but like a grocery store or a big box store, we still need to make sure that those facilities are doing the right thing. Uh, some things I'm hearing right now is not allowing multiple people in the store all at once, which is a great idea. So they're, they're trying to hold them back from the doors, let them get six foot separation, let them in one at a time or, or, or several at a time. Um, again, uh, curtailing hours uh, for, um, for our elderly population. We've heard that before too. Uh, making, again, making sure that when they're inside the store, they have that six foot separation at the cash register. Um, the one thing I, I, I've talked about before is cash registers open back to back to back to back. No, try to go every other one. So again, you're, you're separating people out. The, big, the biggest thing um, I do believe about an essential versus not essential business is that company has got to seriously look at themselves and say, if I am open, am I willing to take the chance of spreading the disease further because I believe that my business is so important to the community that it needs to be open? Grocery stores, yes. Hardware stores, yes. Hobby Lobby, maybe not. Okay, so um, those guidelines, there is a document that the state has put out and people can look at what those um, guidelines are uh, and make that decision. And if um, it's you know kind of up in the air, maybe they make a phone call to um, the health department or um, to the state to find out if they are an essential business. Eric, would you say that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, the other thing that too is uh, I, I heard the governor talk and he was a little surprised too about Hobby Lobby being open. I think that caught kind of everybody by surprise. Um, so I, I know that we'll have staff look at that as well too and make some phone calls to figure out what other counties are doing as well. Uh, much like um, I think we heard on the governor's press conference yesterday, I think it was Lieutenant Governor said, um, we need, locals need to make the best decision that we possibly can. Not everything's going to be right. Um, but we, we trust that, you know, what we do here locally is the best thing for our community. Um, and we've, I think, you know, health department has, has done that. Uh, I know other entities that are in the EOC are doing that every day. And that's what we have to work on. So every issue that comes at us, we have to look at it in a critical lens to make sure that it's following the, the proper pro process and protocols and criteria to not spread the disease. Right. 
Okay, Sheriff uh, Sarah Elms from The Blade is asking if you can provide a brief timeline of the events uh, at the jail when the inmate was booked in, when she started showing symptoms, when she was hospitalized, when she was tested, if you are able to share any information about that. I would certainly like to be able to cooperate and provide that information. Here's my concern is that uh, we don't want to provide the person's name because of, um, of HIPAA and because of uh, them not wanting others to know what uh, is happening with them. So if we start providing times and et cetera, it's gonna be easy to pinpoint who that individual is. So yeah. I have a real concern about doing that. I would love to be able to cooperate, but that's why I cannot. Uh, do you know how the inmate and nurse were exposed to the virus is another question. That we do not know. And uh, so we could just um, trace back to who we feel that they were in contact with and monitor those individuals and to make sure that they didn't have any symptoms. And uh, so that's the best that we can do at this point. Also, she is asking when staff members and other inmates were notified about the positive case and how far back in terms of contact with the in inmate and nurse should people be monitoring their contact with her? Well, we, we went back um, uh, quite a few days. Uh, the uh, media picked up on the, um, the fact that we had two that were uh, uh, diagnosed with the uh, virus. And so uh, that was out rapidly. And um, some way the media found out, which was fine. They called, I confirmed that uh, this occurred. And uh, so the, uh, we have to do better in the future and we're putting plans together of how to get that information out to the staff immediately. And it's a work in progress and some things fell through the cracks. And I personally think they fell through the cracks that we need to get that information out. What type of PPE? You said that people are, um, you know, using gloves for food delivery, that sort of thing, and this has been going on for some time. So, talk a little bit about the PPE that your staff members are, are using. So, we just um, received uh, N95 masks. We did not have them. Uh, we had, we did not have enough masks for everyone. We just was able to get them in. So, we had the mask. We had the gloves uh, that we're utilizing, and. Uh, so there's a, a few gallons that we have for the nursing staff. And uh, so of course we are going to need more. Uh, we're researching and looking to, to get more uh, protective uh, gear into our correction facility. Okay, um, just for clarification, Eric Michaela from 13 ABC is asking, has Hobby Lobby been contacted by the health department or any enforcer who has asked them to close? I don't know about any enforcer, but I know that Hobby Lobby is on the list to, to be contacted. I'll have to find out if we contact it or not. Okay. Jay Hanna from NBC24 is asking Sheriff Tharp, when inmates are deemed not necessary to be in the jail by a judge, where do they go? What are the rules that they have to follow? And maybe also how many people have been released from the jail? So, so um, at any given time, we may have 400 uh, 395 inmates in the jail. We're down to right around 300. Uh, the judges make that decision if they're going to be placed on electronic monitoring or if they're going to be released without any monitoring at all. That's totally the decision of the judges. They do an evaluation and uh, on their appearance records, uh, et cetera, on how violent the crime is. And uh, so those are uh, things that the judges make that decision. Okay, uh, any other questions? I don't see any that were not answered. Oh, uh, we did have one other question here about um, the governor, Eric. This is uh, also from Diane Larson okay. about further uh, enforcing social distancing. And we've been talking about the Metro parks and city parks getting crowded. Um, any thought of shutting them down? Um, again, you know, we're, we're working with the Metro Parks and other park systems, uh, as, we, as we said the other day too, that to make sure that everybody's adhering to social distancing and making sure those parks are safe to be able to use during this time of pandemic. I will tell you, uh, we will make a decision to go 
go further in not allowing people to actually be in the parks if, if we don't use it properly because we cannot afford to have individuals there not, adhere, not adhering to social distancing and having the ability to spread the disease. But again, the Metro Parks is an outstanding organization. You know, they're doing everything they possibly can. I know our city parks are the same way. They're doing everything they can. But it's up to us as the community members to not, to not abuse the right of those parks uh, because they have a responsibility of the community too. And they, they will take that responsibility seriously and, and probably curtail the use of those parks. We need to be careful. Okay. I don't see any other questions. If anybody has any other last minute questions, please make sure you get them in the chat area there. And not seeing any, I wanna thank um, all of our participants today, uh, the health commissioner and sheriff and Matt Hireman from the EOC, as well as Gretchen DeBacker from the EOC as well. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.